Hello again, you sick, twisted weather freaks, and welcome to another fun-filled, action-packed, and intellectually stimulating edition of This Week in Weather. I'm your host, meteorologist DT from WeatherRisk.com, the commander of chaos, the colonel of confusion, the captain of catastrophe, and a diehard baseball fan, as if you didn't know that already. And in This Week in Weather, we have lots to talk about, and uh, of course, so we'll be going into March now as the month is coming to an end, and then we'll be talking about the March pattern and some other things here. First, I guess we'll talk about Mo, Larry, and Curly, how the three systems which I thought were going to develop here in the last week of March, uh, last week of February, completely collapsed. That was unexpected, to say the least. Uh, I thought at least one of them would catch, uh, become a decent mid-Atlantic event, but that's not going to happen. We'll talk about the big event possible for March 2nd and 3rd, which looks like a significant Midwest and New England snowstorm, and the potential for severe weather in the, the Gulf Coast states and the Tennessee Valley. And then perhaps the last chance for mid-Atlantic snow, uh, in the uh, teenage pattern uh, continuing here March 6th and 7th. And then the uh, March teenage pattern itself will continue and what that looks like for all of March. So lots to talk about here. Let's get right started. Now, we'll start with taking a look at the, my three different systems here, Mo, Larry, Curly. I guess maybe Curly still has a shot around March 3rd, of 3rd, uh, 3rd March 4th, but um, even that system looks more like it's going to be the Midwest as opposed to the Mid-Atlantic states So and, and in New England. So uh, all three of these systems failed. And you can see that the March, the, the system for actually tomorrow for Wednesday, that's Mo, uh, February 26th. That's going to be much, much less developed than we thought. The one for March 1st, that's gone. That's not going to affect anybody. And like I said, even the one curly March th uh, 4th, that's going to be much further uh, inland towards the Ohio Valley in New England. So none of these systems worked out at all. They all fell apart. And that's very disappointing about that. I mean, uh, I'd, I've taken a little bit of flack. People say, well, you know, Dave, now what happened? And I'm like, weather changes. What can I tell you? I really thought one of these systems would catch. Uh, to see all three of them in a short week of time, you know, I guess it was about seven days of time, to see all three of them significantly fall apart or change, that was a little discouraging. In any event, that's the name of the game, so let's move on. Uh, we'll start out by taking a look at the pattern here. This is for February uh, 19th, and in this pattern here, we can see uh, how mild the pattern had become. This was about a week ago now, and we can see that the uh, Pacific jet had come roaring in. The western the ridge, which had been all up in here, is now gone, so we now have this Pacific jet coming in. That brought the first rains in the California and the Pacific Northwest, and then, of course, uh, we had a positive Arctic oscillation, a little bit of a ridge here. All the blocking seemed to have weakened uh, quite a bit, and a little, still a little bit there in Canada, but it was uh, really a, a very benign-looking pattern. And at this point, some folks were saying that the second half of February was that was the end of winter. There are a couple of different weather sources, private meteorologists, that were talking about the after mid-February, the winter was over completely, and that turned out to be wrong. But uh, Again, that's the name of the game. Now, starting on the 22nd, I guess, which was last weekend, this is when we had the severe weather start coming through. Remember the thunderstorms which came through and the severe weather in the Midwest? Here is the low right here, and uh, this was the low here, and the cold front came down this way, and you know, a lot of severe weather here in the east. I uh, began to see the ridge begin to redevelop here once again and begin to see this ridge coming out of Scandinavia and eastern Russia pushing towards the North Pole, and that's going to drive this fe feature southward, and that's exactly what's happened, and that's why the polar vortex is re-energized. It's this feature coming up here, and this feature, this ridge here, forcing this baby to come southward, and that we re-energized. Now, the pattern already turned cold again by February 22nd, but not really cold. It was that the movement of these two ridges is what caused the pattern to begin to shift, and now finally we end up with this current pattern, February 25th. What's happened here is that, remember that ridge we talked about right, right here? It's now uh, taken off, and you can see it developing very nicely, excuse me, uh, right here, okay? And then the other ridge we saw in Scandinavia and in Western Russia, that's now built up. They're now linked over the North Pole again, and when you have linkage, that forces the polar vortex southward, and now you have this big monster trough and a new blast of Arctic air coming in. So uh, all in all, a, uh, that was the pat for the 22nd. You can see the shift here continuing. Again, see, what, see how they moved to here. And now we have, that's the current pattern. Now, if we take a look at our teleconnections, here's the Arctic Oscillation. Well, as we can see, uh, it stays pretty close to uh, somewhat negative and then moving up a little bit towards neutral by the middle of March. Um, and that's not a surprise given how far south the vortex have been forced southward. And if we look at our tendencies here, 
our different teleconnections. Here is the Western Pacific Oscillation negative and moving solely towards neutral. The Eastern Pacific Oscillation strongly negative, moving towards neutral. And of course, when it's negative like this, that supports a, a P&A. Right here, you can see that. Now remember, the EPO, what that is, that's really the Alaskan Ridge. Okay, so when, the, so when this is negative, you have a big ridge in Alaska and you have a big P&A on the, on the West Coast. So that's what the EPO is, if you get confused by it. And then this is the NAO right here, and there's our P&A. Now remember, the, uh, the EPO is negative, so now it's positive, then it drops down again here. Here's like this, and then it goes back, about, back up again. So generally a pretty positive uh, P&A for the next two weeks with a big ridge on the West Coast. And the NAO remains as it has all winter long, except for a few times, very steadily positive the whole winter long, which is typical of a positive TNH pattern. You have a strong, uh, sometimes a, a neutral or negative Arctic oscillation, but the NAO stays always positive. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. And then, now this is our next big system here for next week. Now, what happens is here's our ridge on the West Coast. Let me call this up to you so you can see it right here. Okay, let's follow the green line. See that there's the ridge on the West Coast. There's a big Aleutian low. So you're popping a ridge. There you go. Okay, that's that, there's your Alaskan ridge. That's your EPO right here, the West Coast. And okay, and now here's our neck Arctic high. That's a 1050 if you can't see it. That's a big baby. And there's the Arctic front coming through this way. The problem is we have a high off the coast. Look at this. The Southeast Ridge is back. Very classic TNH, TNH, positive TNH pattern. So we have a new Arctic front here, and all along this front, we've got a lot of precipitation developing here, March 2nd, 3rd, and into the 4th. And this is going to be a significant snow and ice event for the Central Plains, the Midwest, and into the northern Mid-Atlantic and New England states, but for, for more, according to what all the data is showing from what I can see. So, uh, and that seems, you know, very reasonable given the overall pattern. Now, this is the European model from this afternoon. You can see the more detail here, March 2nd, March 3rd, and again, March uh, uh, 1, I guess 1 o'clock on the, you know, March 2nd. Uh, that would be March 3rd, excuse me. This is the wrong date in here. This should be March 3 here. See that? There you go. But uh, there you can see the line uh, very nicely. There's the boundary right here. There's the Arctic high. And again, we have ice in the, into Arkansas, Kentucky with the cold air, too warm for snow off, a lot of snow to the north. And then also uh, from north of, pretty much north of D.C., most of Pennsylvania, New England gets a big snow out of this. So does Indiana, Ohio. This is a severe weather threat right here in Kentucky, uh, Georgia, Alabama, maybe the Carolinas as well. And it looks like a rain event in Virginia and Maryland, maybe a little bit of ice in Maryland. Um, and that seems very reasonable to me. I don't see any reason to go against that. And you can see in the enlargement here, if you look at the uh, <clears throat> rain snow line here in the purple, I, I drew it in so you can see it right there. It's north of D.C., maybe a little ice in D.C., but mostly this is a New England, Pennsylvania, uh, northeast type of snowstorm. Okay. Um, if we look at the ensembles, this is the European ensembles, and this is valid here for the March 2nd and March 3rd. You can see the warm air very clearly, very pronounced. Um, here's our low right here, as you can see it. And look where the front is. The Arctic front is here and like this. So that's the rain snow line. It's actually uh, by Philadelphia. So there may be some ice in northern Maryland, northern Virginia, and some ice down in here and then snow to the north. So the ensembles are very supportive of that whole idea. And this is what the European snow map looks like. You can see this takes us to the evening of March 4th. That's a lot of snow in here in Kentucky. Uh, that may be overdone. I think that's ice mostly, but Pennsylvania snow, New England snow, New York City snow, Ohio looks to be mostly snow. So that's a pretty impressive snow mount. That's 12, 15, 16, 18 inches in snow, some locations. And this is the GFS on this afternoon. It supports the same idea. Now, the GFS, this is for March 6th or 7th. Now, this is the next system. After, that's, after this one blows on through, here's our next one. And it has, as you can see, this uh, low pressure area right in here, there's the Arctic high that comes in on March 6th, and then March 7th, the low goes off the coast. That might be the case. We'll see. Uh, you know, I have my doubts about this, but this could be the last system chance for the Mid-Atlantic states. Uh, the European, uh, this afternoon European, shows the same sort of thing. You can see the Arctic high, very strong. Uh, that's 1044 right here, folks. That's a 1044 millibars. Here's the Arctic high. We can see the wedging down this way, some sort of low trying to develop here. Same general idea, but again, it's nine days out, and the European and the GFS have not been very good the last couple of weeks. So I'm not that 
excited about this yet. It's got possibilities, but again, we have to get the cold air in here. Uh, I'll have to wait and see if the cold air comes in after March 3rd and 4th. That's the really big deal for the Mid-Atlantic states. And this is the pattern. This is why the European develops it. And then the GFS, they have a little bit of a short wave right here in the southern jet. You can see it. You still have, there's your 50-50 low over southeastern Canada bringing the cold air in. So that looks like the potential for a decent snowstorm or an ice storm for the lower Mid-Atlantic states, maybe the Tennessee Valley. And this is the European Ensemble for March 3rd, March, uh, excuse me, this is March 6th, the European Ensemble for March 6th, excuse me. And you can see that we have a, a good high right, right up in here, a big a 1040, 1031 high up in here. A lot of cold air. You see the bending in the isobars? That's your cold air damming. You see how the isobars bend here? See how they bend? That's your cold air damming. So again, this could be a snow event or ice event for the Mid-Atlantic states, March 6th or 7th. And this is the operational European, which has the low off the coast. Not very impressive, but it's got something. If we look at the MJO, as we go on to March, we see that the European and the European weeklies are taking the MJO, as you can see, let me call it up here, uh, into phase eight, March 11th, and then towards phase one phase one, excuse me, and then to go to the end of March, this is the European weeklies, phase eight, phase one, and then bring it back into the circle of death by the time we get to the end of the month. And what that means is for the overall pattern, this is uh, phase eight, a little cool here on the East Coast, but not a lot in terms of temperatures, but phase one and two are really quite cold, and so is phase three. So this clearly shows that most of March is going to be a pretty cold month, according to the MJO. If we look at the CFS, what do we see? Uh, more cold temperatures. This is the CFS from today. Uh, remember, this is 16 members. This is just today's. That's a very, very impressively cold pattern. Uh, and if we look at the last 10 days since February 17th, the trend as we're getting closer to March is colder, not warmer. That's significant. And of course, this is the precipitation map as of today. Again, pretty dry over the upper plains in Midwest and Canada. Look pretty wet in California, actually. That's not that's not bad in the southwestern states. And if we see the trend, we continue to see increasing moisture on the west coast and pretty dry over the plains and the Great Lakes. So the trend as we go to March, each day we get closer and closer to March, the model should be more and more accurate, is to show increasing cold for March relative to normal, not as cold as January, but relative to normal and the rainfall relative to normal. And this is a typical January teenage pattern here. So we'll look at this for one second. And here's your ridge, as you can see it. There's your trough and the south, your southeast ridge. So the cold is aligned like this, okay? The cold is not on the east coast. It's in the Midwest, the upper plains, into the Rockies. So that's what your typical teenage pattern is. Now, this is the pattern we saw in December, okay? And this is your classic teenage pattern right here, as you can see. Uh, there's your uh, vortex right here. Look at the southeast ridge. You see it. There's your west ridge in the eastern Pacific. And sure enough, where is the cold air? Right here. And where is the warm air? Right here. See how this matches this? There you go. Okay. That's what the December pattern was. Now we went to January. What happens is, and then you get this is the upper map. This is a classic teenage pattern. Again, look how the cold air is aligned. This way. See? Like that. Not on the east coast. All right? That's the point of that map. That's the actual December map. This was January. Now the vortex gets really big and it plunges southward. And every single time you have a positive teenage pattern in January, you've always had big Arctic outbreaks. And we had three or four of them this winter, so and we also had a lot of snow. The southeast ridge got suppressed. So this was a classic positive teenage pattern. This is February. Now February is different. Look what happens here at the vortex. It doesn't come southward. It expands this way. And, as, and the southeast ridge begins to exert itself. So now you have more of a, a, a southeast ridge, a storm track running uh, west-southwest to east-northeast, and you get a lot of severe weather and winter storms that way into the Midwest and New England late in February and especially into March. And if we take a look at the – see how that's going to work out. Uh, look, here's the cold air on the European. Now, this is for the next – uh, five days, uh, this next uh, temperature anomalies over the next four days, you can see the severe cold um, on the European uh, 850 temperatures over the upper plains, not yet into the mid-Atlantic or the lower Midwest or New England, but it's getting there. And then if you look further down the road, this is the European 850 temperatures out to day nine. Again, look where the cold air is. The cold air is in here. Positive teenage pattern, no doubt about it. So, and if we look at the week three and week four, week three, we can see a lot of uh, below normal heights in the eastern United States. Big ridge here on the west coast. You can see it very nicely. There's your ridge. There's your trough again. But it breaks down in week four, and you can see it very clearly here. 
Uh, the CFS pattern week four shows the ridge coming into the southeastern states, a trough developing on the west coast, and the pattern begins to finally break down and end as we get towards the end of March. Hopefully, we'll maybe see some signs of spring. And we can see that with the CFS. Again, uh, this is very consistent. The last six or eight runs of the CFS have showed a lot of cold air in the eastern United States right here as we go into mid-March. And as we go towards the 18th and 24th, the whole pattern breaks down. This is meteorologist DT from weatherist.com. I'll talk to you soon.